Okay, it's quarter past, so I'd like to give you all a warm welcome uh, to these sessions that we're hosting today, SWEDU, the Swedish Development Aid Organization. Um, first of all, of course, we'd like to thank uh, Region Westerbotten that kindly are hosting us under their umbrella here. Uh, not only due to the rain, but also we have a space to talk about the world's, uh, at the moment, the world's biggest refugee crisis. Um, we're here for two reasons, and uh, we have some really distinguished guests tonight who will, who will join us and talk and, and, and share some stories and, and come with some explanations of what's going on and, and how can we see, can we see stabilization taking part, etc., etc. But before that, I'd just like to underline that we're here for two reasons, and uh, the first one is that we have, in the area, we have about six million IDPs in Syria, internally displaced people, people that run away from their homes forcibly. We have about, additional to that, we have about six million roughly refugees, people that left Syria due to the crisis that's, going, that's been going on since 2011. If we add uh, Iraq to the situation, we have about three million refugees there. IDP, sorry, uh, three million, uh, three million people, uh, and 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 that someone, uh, if we compare that to the uh, UNHCR's latest reports, that there is about seventy, between seventy to seventy-one million refugees in the world at the moment that has been forcibly forced away from their homes, their country, and their families, or 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 their local context. We are about to give you some context of what's going on in this area, and it covers about 20%, I would say. Uh, secondly, uh, SWEDU, the Swedish Development Aid Organization, we're not very known in Sweden. Uh, we've been operating in uh, northern Iraq for over 28 years now, and we have an average about 1 million beneficiaries per year. And we just made a name change in January to make it more complex. Uh, so we went from Kandil to Swedu. And uh, we are here today to share our local stories from the context with some really distinguished guests from, so that that's had some, some, uh, some very interesting experience in their lives. Um, so the introduction. The first session here will be about 40, 45 minutes. And uh, after that, we will change to another panel and, and move on with some other questions. And this, quest this first session will be in English, of course. So uh, please let me introduce uh, Ulrika Modi, former State Secretary and now Assistant Secretary General and Director of, Euro of External Relations at UNDP, United Nations Development Program. Thank you. Also, we have uh, Hussein Botani, who is the uh, current country director of Sweden in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, also a former UN staff with uh, experience from Libya, uh, Syria, and of course Iraq, with the operations we're conducting there. Uh, if we have time, we will invite you for some questions in the end. And uh, it will be controlled. You can control that, Josephine. We have a microphone here. So let's start with the first question here. So uh, representing uh, UNDP, can you uh, explain a little bit about how is UNDP has a special focus? How, what is that special, special focus? What, what mandate does UNDP have within the other UN agencies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So United Nations Development Program was the first and has become also the biggest development offer of the United Nations and thus for the international community and the member states. And it has a very broad mandate because UNDP was set up to combat poverty and all of you in the audience would know that this means working with many different things. But very soon, of course, UNDP understood, as you also do, that in order to combat poverty, uh, it's not only about economic development, we need to support institution building. 
So democratic governance, rule of law, anti-corruption, respect for human rights is really at the core of UNDP's work. Mm. Now, as you described, and as we also know, we live in a world with protracted crisis, many conflicts that last many, many years. They are each year even more complex, uh, crossing borders, and many times also with the international interest uh, uh, fueling these conflicts in different ways, where the United Nations through the Security Council has not been able to handle these situations. So UNDP also has a mandate which is about conflict prevention, but also peace and state building, and this is also why our presence is very important and why we work also in the same areas of work uh, in countries like uh, Syria, uh, but also uh, Iraq. Uh, in Syria, very much uh, at the local level, just sustaining local services in different ways, and I will come back to that. But in a country like Iraq, more with bigger stabilization programs, uh, aiming at also uh, more of development uh, with the work that UNDP does. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, I would also like just to share with you, and I'll mention some examples, that UNDP also has a very strong mandate, an increasingly important mandate to do work on environment and climate change. And of course, even though in many of the countries affected by conflict, this is not perhaps the daily preoccupation, but all of us know that this also can be a trigger of conflict. And when we want to work with long-term resilience and, and really building a sustainable future for all countries in the world, this is really an important component. Mm -hmm. And lastly, gender equality. It is within UNDP's strategic plan, but certainly also within the UN's strategy to see to that we strengthen gender equality. And this is also the case uh, in the work that we do both in Syria and Iraq. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll choose to pick up this stabilization here. You we, we mentioned Iraq. Uh, Hussein, historically, since 2013, something like that, Sweden was, has been engaged in massive humanitarian uh, programs. Um, activities all over Iraq and the shift now towards stabilization. Can you explain a little bit what's going on in Iraq here? Um, I think uh, um, previously Kandil, now Suidu, our engagement was based on the needs and uh, what kind of activities um, to uh, bring the relief and the aid uh, to the communities and also our beneficiaries at that stage were mostly of internally displaced people and refugees. And uh, you all remember the ISIS uh, event in 2014 and the aftermath. So um, uh, we had to react accordingly together with uh, our partner UNHCR and other uh, partners from international community. But uh, recently, and uh, now it's noticeably also, the situation is going toward stabilization. And there's uh, another type of uh, needs are emerging now. And this, we need to deal with the sort of massive you know, population being displaced uh, to certain locations. And uh, the indicators uh, done by uh, United Nations and other partners are not showing um, very strong um, indicators that people would go back to their place of origin. Uh, in that regard, we had to develop programs for integration, uh, capacity building, livelihood, uh, to meet the emerging needs. Um, we are working with UNHCR in what we call uh, bridging from emergency towards stabilization. And that's the early steps of development, as we know. And areas uh, such as Ninawa, Mosul, we all know, uh, that been liberated and people are now um, comfortable to go back, but they need livelihood projects and th things that support them on a daily basis. Mm. So this humanitarian and developing aid, the matches here, Ulrika, can you explain that a little bit more? How, so, how do you explain it? Well, <laughs> it is, and we call it a nexus within the United Nations and the international community, and it's many times overlapping because what we see and what you would experience also given your history in OCHA, the United Nations Humanitarian Coordination Office, is that uh, in 
some countries and contexts, it's it's simply not allowed to because there is not uh, a legal framework. Uh, by the United Nations that allows long-term development work based on a stabilization program. And there, the humanitarian work is really important. Uh, but some of the humanitarian work is also important because of upholding uh, the local institutions and the services. So we, many times you would perhaps think that humanitarian assistance is all about um, food and shelter and, and uh, saving lives, while we know that also at the local level there is of course a need for people living their daily lives to have the services, legal services. People get married, people have family members who die, people need to legalize things and so on. So there is it's really a need also to see uh, how to uphold, not really uh, long-term uh, development work, but actually the local institutions that are in place, because we know, and this is also the experience from Iraq, that if we only focus on pure, what you would see as humanitarian assistance, then the costs of building up once again, when the country and the communities are ready, is so much higher. So there is a need for the humanitarian community and agencies such as United Nations Development Programme working on more long-term development to figure out who should do what uh, in order also to see that we use the money uh, for international development cooperation because today only half of, of the humanitarian appeals are actually covered. So we need to be much more clever to think where do we need to invest with regard to prevention, humanitarian assistance, and where can we then match with more long-term development work, both at local level, regional level, and then hopefully also at national level once countries are ready. An interesting question here about Iraq working with stabilization, uh, resilience, uh, capacity building. Um, could you talk a little bit of what you're doing in Syria? In Syria? In Syria, in, yes. in, So in, in Syria, Syria uh, where there is not a framework mm -hmm. agreed upon for more long-term development work, uh, UNDP's work is very much in line with what I understand that SWEDU does. It's, it's about support at local level to uphold livelihoods. Uh, but it's also, as I said, work where we try to work with local authorities to uphold also services at local level. This is what more or less we are allowed to do. Uh, but then, of course, we hope that in the future we will also see an agreed framework where we are allowed to do more long-term interventions also at, at national level. Mm -hmm but that is still to be seen. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Hussein, could you, uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what, are, what are we doing in, in Syria uh, in terms of is there, what, is, what, is the, what is the biggest need in, in, in the parts we're in now, northeast Syria? We all know that there is a well-functioning uh, humanitarian assistance uh, also you know, beneath Damascus, you know, under Damascus control, but the northeast and especially the northeast areas where we are in. Uh, we're trying to address the needs as much as we can, but um, um, when we talk about the needs, uh, it remains solely right now on the basic services, and by that we mean health, education, water sanitation, etc. That's um, and, and, and country uh, after war, that is what you can expect. So um, the donors' attention and also international communities in that regard. We as Swedo, uh, we started months ago some activities and um, we are really engaged with the communities when it comes to the uh, capacity building and vocational training and uh, with a special focus on livelihood and the agriculture in some areas like Raqqa, uh, north and south of Raqqa. And we are definitely aiming to expand and uh, also duplicate the good experience that we had in Iraq uh, and benefit the Syrian population there. Well, when, when, you're, when, we're, when we're talking here, you're saying, Ulrika, there is no, there's no framework for Syria yet, and there's, no, there's not, nothing really. What, what is the meaning of, of uh, INGOs uh, being a part of, of actually being in Syria, doing uh, livelihood or humanitarian assistance? What role do they play in this, in this game which is played above all of us, the geopolitics around? 
there is no frame or there is no there is no chance for sustainability is su sustainable aid mm -hmm. even though we, we work for this we use rights approaches we 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 we, we have a gender perspective um, what are the INGOs role here? So I think that the international presence is, of course, very important in practice for those people who have stayed and are very important to once rebuild the country, mm -hmm. both hopefully uh, uh, with regard to democracy and, and human rights and rule of law, but, but also, of course, to, to once again rebuild uh, the country that has been destructed also economically. Uh, and... As was said, and I think this is very important, we also see now that there is a tendency for people to try to want to return. But of course, if you are to return, especially if you have kids, you will not return unless it's not only about livelihoods or to get that humanitarian support, but actually to be able to offer your child a school uh, or uh, medical care. Uh, and uh, I mean, the destruction is, is really a problem. So in due course time, I mean, we need to see also more of development efforts. Otherwise, uh, I'm afraid, and maybe you have much more of experience that, I mean, people will not try to return perhaps two or three times. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have children in school, I mean, you at one stage, you need to, to decide whether you are going to, to stay where you are actually try to return. So it's, it's a very critical time now where the presence of, of international NGOs, such as we do and others, uh, is very, very important to give hope uh, for more people to actually go also back and, and rebuild <coughs> their lives. Hussein, what are the challenges, if we connect to this, what are the challenges of running an organization that have operations in Syria and Northeast Syria now, if you want to reach the, the development sector? What are the challenges from, from an INGO perspective? Mm -hmm. I think um, um, the stability is at, at the earliest stage. So uh, we all know that some of the areas have been recently liberated. So uh, there, is, there are security challenges, access issues, uh, for some of the partners, and, and the infra infrastructure is devastated, so that should be rebuilt first. You need the institutions and running institutions, and then you take further steps on good governance and working on transparency, the capacity building of other institutions. So um, in some places they are ready, uh, because they've been liberated long time ago, and there are some local governance functioning, um, but they lack funding. That's uh, financial resources as the biggest challenge mm -hmm. there. And um, uh, also, um, how we conduct the work there. You need a hub outside Syria in, in this time. I mean, in the future, that may change. And uh, as you know, we are doing it through cross-border uh, operations, so that's a lot of logistics in terms of mobilizing, uh, getting the permission for our ex um, technical expats, and then uh, the material and supply chain. So all this needs a uh, very detailed and very technical, thoroughly thought plan, uh, which could be much easier once things are more stable inside the country. Mm. I would say on, on, uh, if, we, if we, we shift a bit between Iraq and, and Syria, I think it's good because we're talking about stabilization and sustainable aid at some point and also early recovery at, and, and at some stage here. So if we move back to the uh, stabilization part here, if we move up to the northern parts of Iraq, we have about two and a half million roughly displaced people still in, Kurdi, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Kurdistan area of Iraq, region of Iraq. Yeah. Now, some of these people stay there quite some time. And these uh, camps are being developed and more developed and people feel more rooted there than in other places. How, how on earth is this returnee programs or operations going, going to take part? Um, Oh, when I was there, I saw, you know, they have cars, they're operating their own businesses, some of them get the residency card, they feel that they, they, yes. they have the life here. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the positive aspect uh, is that uh, the regional government 
and also Iraqi government to a certain extent, uh, they are uh, against forced return, which is in compliance with the international standards there. So um, that would result, and we need to find a solution together, all of us. And this has been now problem of So uh, camps are still there, but there is a freedom of movement for people, right to work and study to get the education, right to drive and also um, a license to practice you know, any, any job that they are willing. So those are good ground to uh, observe some of the problems. But you know that uh, you know, uh, with so many, such high number of refugees and the displaced Iraqis in the northern Iraq, the basic services are under tremendous pressure. Health, education, electricity, etc. In the region, it's not yet uh, very stable. We can define that as such. So uh, what we are trying to do is, and, and in very simplified word, uh, like some people tell us, don't give us a fish, teach us fishing. You know, We, we want to work. We don't want to eat an emergency. We don't want this food parcels at the end of the month. You know, we want to be part of the society. And this is what where Swedo was successful because since 91 been engaged with the communities. So for us it was easier to talk to people and talk to those, you know, the newcomers and integrate. Find certain projects that they can work together, come up to their best practices. And as approach, and we discussed that with our partners, there is no um, magical formula there. You need to understand the context, the context of that village, of that community. What are the ethnic groups involved? What kind of competencies they have? And take the positive aspects, work with the youth outreach programs that we have, support them to the extent, and also work with the government to build their capacity to come up there with the best best practices. Sometimes it's job opportunities, sometimes in enhancing their uh, life conditions, and sometimes uh, it comes to the very basic needs in, in some remote areas. Because basically, their funding is not enough to have a comprehensive, one big plan for all the beneficiaries. We have to admit and we have to work together to bring more improvements. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that local context, uh, the area, the knowledge, the, 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 uh, um, the religions, that takes a bit of a play, big part here in the conflict the last half, thousand years. And, and uh, you mentioned in the beginning, Rika, one of your special focus at UNDP are gender equality and empowerment. Um, could you give us a little bit of understanding how you how you work with that when you work with capacity mm. building. And I will do that. I just wanted to comment on these Please. best practices Please because do. they are very important for the international community because when we see countries, as is the case now also with, as you say, the uh, support also from the Iraqi government but also in, in the Kurdish areas where Display, uh, internally displaced people uh, or refugees are allowed also to work and to establish new ways of living in without being locked into a humanitarian situation. This gives really good ground also for that humanitarian development nexus and for people also uh, to move on and, and be more independent. And, and we see these best practices here, but we also see them in, in Uganda and we see them in Kenya. And I think that this is very, very important for the international community also to be able to deal with these protracted crises and, and the lack of, uh, of humanitarian funding and the necessity to see to that we can give people hope that there can actually also um, be a future where they will be not dependent on, on aid but actually uh, be able to develop their lives as they would like. Um, now on uh, the focus. Uh, no, 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 now we're drifting yeah, apart. Well, let's yeah. wait with the uh, gender equality. <laughs> Something that struck me there was you know when when you when we talk about the uh, sustainable aid here, some some sustainability and and how do you explain that to the people? I mean, what we're working here with this has some is time consuming. 
mm. when you meet these people. And, and uh, if you relate that to immediate humanitarian assistance, people in so the camp, it's very effective. They feel the right effect. They get the food. They are there. They, are there, they, are, you know, they feel that someone is taking care of them. How do you communicate this to, to people? Uh, how do you measure this? And how do you give the results to the people? Um, so I think, as was said, this is what mm. many people want, to have mm. the opportunity to actually control their own lives. Mm. But one of the challenges is also that we might see increased conflict also with the people who live in the areas. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is also why in some countries, like uh, Bangladesh, uh, that took the responsibility for almost one million Rohingya mm. refugees coming to Bangladesh, have maintained also the importance of, of keeping this as a, a humanitarian support and not uh, creating uh, the idea among also the neighboring communities and, and the Bangladeshi people living there that this will be a permanent situation. And I guess that this is also what you alluded to when you said that yeah, there might also be questions raised uh, by people living in these areas uh, when work permits are being allowed and so on. So there are pros and cons, uh, but uh, we certainly believe when we discuss with our humanitarian colleagues that this is the way forward, but of course taking into account different contexts and countries, and you would know what it looks like in... Yes, def definitely. So we, we need to be um, you know, really appreciative when it comes to uh, that kind of stand. In, um, in areas that are not stable yet uh, and the security challenges are always there. So part of the uh, solution is also uh, while trying to enable uh, the beneficiaries for have, having a better future is to solve the legal issues associated with that. So uh, many people who have uh, been left their homes, uh, they were without papers so they were stateless. And uh, I'm talking about Iraqi people inside Iraq. Thousands and thousands of them, they were not able to, uh, to get what, what, is, what is just normal rights of any citizen in Iraq, access to the education, access to the food ration, and the other services that, which is not a lot, uh, but they were not uh, uh, having that kind of uh, privilege because they didn't have the papers when they left. So um, we work together with the partners, and this is not an emergency response. It is, involves the, building the capacity of the government to be responsive and be also efficient in, in terms of issuing those papers and helping people to get uh, the legal documents and obtain their rights. Mm. Part of the solution. Mm. Yeah, that's good to have. Sorry for intervening. Let's go back to the uh, so gender focus. equality. Yes. yes. So I think that we have a unique opportunity also with the values and the normative work of of the UN, but also many international partners and also many local partners, of course, to really see to that we in all interventions focus on women that have been disproportionately, of course, affected by the conflict. This we know, but they are also very important agents of change. So when we work with our livelihood projects, as I guess you would do as well, we focus on women to build their capacity and, and really to see to that they can also be these drivers of change. So more than 60% uh, of, of our livelihood interventions are directed towards women right now. Uh, this would not naturally be the case. So I think that we have a possibility there to make a drive uh, and, and push uh, and that we will also see really good results in the hands of these women leaders at local level uh, that can also give good ground for uh, gender equality to uh, remain as one of the strong pillars once we move into even more of development efforts, uh, both at regional and national level. That's really impressive, 60%, mm -hmm. I'll give you that. That's really, really special, especially in these contexts, in these environments. It's uh, Hussein. Can you give us an example of how Sweden is uh, working with gender yeah. perspective? Well, we work very, very hard in the bringing the, uh, the gender equality and equity to our work throughout programs. But uh, we started with ourselves. And so uh, as an organization and, and working in the Middle East, it is not easy because uh, women generally not empowered. So the competencies are not equal because they don't have equal chances, not because not 
they are not smart, they are brilliant actually when they have access to the education and they, they get their opportunities. You see, you know, a really strong woman and can really deliver and do the job. In the organization itself, I think we are uh, in very good position. Uh, and that being translated to our projects and programs. We pay special attention to that and how we recruit people, how, how we build the capacity and how we enable through uh, certain trainings and um, uh, workshops uh, to bring that kind of quality uh, in terms of uh, gender balance in our projects. Um, the, Numbers are fine, but uh, we are very ambitious. And as a Swedish organization, we are always not happy with the results that we have now. But we have to, uh, you know, work harder on that. Um, but with the strategy that we have, I think we will reach there in the coming years. Um, it is going to, to in the right path. Like Would you see any difference working uh, with, with gender equality with our operations in Iraq, if you compare that to Syria, where we're in now? Um, I think um, when there is a conflict, then uh, that shakes everything. So, uh, and uh, same valid for the you know, uh, gender issues there. But um, in Syria, I see the opportunity higher. It is just as the community, the culture is a bit different. Uh, you know, uh, what we deal with the communities in Iraq, the more conservative when it comes to uh, women engagement in the programs. In Syria, uh, despite that, um, you know, we're working in the, in the, in the stabilization programs, uh, we realize that uh, they are willing and uh, they have that kind of, you know, uh, proactiveness. And that comes. So uh, we are very, very uh, optimistic when it comes to the projects in the Syria. Good indicators there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're running out of time. You want to add something, or can we uh, let people have some questions? Yes. No. Or, no. So we're we're about to close up here the first uh, session. Uh, I'm I'm giving the word to the audience here. If anyone have. A question, an opportunity to ask Hussein or Ulrika anything about the topics in the area and the region, refugees, gender equality. No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and uh, thank you for this knowledge. Thank you very much. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.